So please, please kindly uh, help you. Yes. Acknowledge you. Okay, my heart is pumping very fast now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. My heart is pumping very fast now because I'm speaking among the bishop, the archbishop, and also the fathers and also the uh, theologians. I'm a very young youth worker. So the topic that we can talk about. The topic that presents to me is the reality of youth in terms of minor religions and also social cultural situation. So um, uh, basically my presentation will be in two parts. One part is about the big pictures of what is happening in Malaysian youth today. The second part will be uh, um, what happened with youth in minor religions and also in social cultural context. So, uh, because of the title is this, so I would more emphasize on the uh, second part rather than the first part. So I will jump very fast. So basically, what our youth facing today in Malaysia is basically divided to four: political and humanitarian awareness, economy, racial, and also social. Let us look at Malaysia population today. Um, from the chart, we can see that youth age 24 and below has taken up almost 40% of the population. So it's a large number of youth in Malaysia. So um, in Malaysia, we have only mainstream media and also under government policy. What happened to our youth today is they live in their own circle, in their own comfort zone, they, and they ignore about um, their own rights. They are ignorant. They do not know what is their own rights as citizens and also as youth. So they have a very low in own perception that they are active agents of change to community and countries. Um, in Malaysia, there are around only 47% of youth are registered as voters. Because the same government has been ruling for 54 years and they don't see themselves as an active agent of change because they don't think they are, which actually they are. So, what happened? So, they fail to relate themselves with a, with a marginalized community, with a solidarity with the poor. Because they are living in their own circle, they don't go out. They do. That is the main problem of our youth in Malaysia today. Under the, under the economic policy that are still going on now, new economic policy, the aim of this policy is actually to eradicate poverty. But what happened in this policy is when the implementation only gives the advantage to the rich one, especially the Bumi trust. what happened in this policy is like this. He pour on a company, let's say company A, and Paul is a non booming trust, then he must give 30% of his share to the booming trust, no matter they involve in the country, no, no matter they involve in the company or not, 30% must be given to booming trust in order to serve their right as the city, as the native of the country. So under this policy, it's not helping the poor at all, especially the native poor as well. So what happened is, the rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poor. They cannot afford to send their children to school. Then social, social problem came in. So you see, according to the statistic and the, from the prisons department, uh, there are thirty percent of the inmates are primary educations. Seventy percent of them are secondary educations. Because of the lack of education under this economic policy, many of our youth are suffering. And this policy also gives way to corruption, where the poor can't get enough what they want. Corruption comes the ways and they take it. What happened in Malaysia today is Malaysia is the lowest rating in transparency. International in the latest perception corruption index for 2010. Corruption has been going in a way that is so corrupted 
from um, public transportation to police, from police to government, from government to government officer, to everywhere is corruption. What if this corruption didn't happen? This money could have been used for our youth empowerment and also for education project for these youth that do not have chance to go to school. So uh, the next problem in our youth, or this problem is very, very uh, serious actually in Malaysia today, racial problem. What I show you today is um, differences between Malays and non-Malay, and Muslim and non-Muslim. What privileges do they have? What I'm showing you here is not to uh, magnifying that the differences between us, but I want you to see that what is the root of our discrimination, racial discrimination, especially happening in our our country today among the youth. So if you are Malay and if you are Muslim, what you will get is you get all the government policy, you get all the education laws, you get all the housing laws. Let's say the public exams, the passing mark for the Muslim and Malays is 80 marks. Let's say it's 80 marks for non-Muslim and non-Malay. So if you are Muslim and Malay, 65 marks you get passed. It's never been a fair for education policy in our country especially. And also despite of that, their, their entry to higher institutions Let's say 60% is given to uh, Malays and only like 20% is given to non-Muslim and things like that. It happens. I'm not here to magnify what is our differences, but this is part the root cause that happens in the in our youth today that they think that they are being discriminated in terms of race. Okay, we will look at the racial polarization in higher institution lead from the uh, situation just now. So you can see from the University of Malaya, they do a survey that almost 99% of Chinese students include, unfortunately include me as well, <laughs> and 97 of Indian students, we don't mingle with other races, we don't. Thus, misunderstanding and stereotype is often come to place and it makes it very difficult for us to foster unity and tolerance between races. So social problems also come in place uh, among the youth today, especially the juvenile crimes, drug and drug abuse, also I think happens in other countries as well. So this is come to the main point of our topic today about in challenges of youth in minority. I would like to focus in three uh, different areas that I think is very, very important in terms of conversion, proselytization, and also social cultural perspective. Let's look at Malaysia. Malaysia population has only 3% Catholic, which is around 850,000, and uh, 9 dioceses, includes 3 dioceses. And 9% of them, um, of the population, are Hindus. Or oh, no, are Indian who, are, who practice Hinduism. Uh, for my presentation, I would like to look at minority as not only Catholicism, not only Christianity, but also other religions <coughs> like Hinduism as well. So, um, why did I uh, stress on the issue of conversion, especially in minority today? I think it's uh, very, very important for us to stress on this issue because it's very rare happening in Malaysia, especially among youth. So, uh, what is the contributing uh, factors of conversion? Because our official religion is uh, Islam, and also most of the governments, government officers are mostly Muslim, so conversion has been manifested in a way that it is no more a conversion of heart, in terms of faithful, that you really want to join the religion. It's more to conversion because the privileges that you get when you join the religion. And these privileges are undoubtedly is one of the attracting elements for conversion to happen, especially in a poor rural area, especially those who are lack of this ability and benefit. Changing familial structure also, like, um, let's say, um, I work in, um, maybe I'm, um, I'm from Penang, then I work in Sabah, Sarawak, 
I'm apart from my time, from my family. So uh, when I'm going abroad to other places, then I uh, tend to get uh, vulnerable because no family uh, support in terms of um, my faith mm, and maybe I don't go to church anymore. And then this late conversion has chance to take place when we are vulnerable. And also our youth today, they are mostly lack of strong foundation and based religiously. So, uh, this is the fact that I get from my student. Actually, I work for you, so I get from my student. What happened is, um, uh, the Islam, they will come to door to door evangelization approach or through inter-religious marriage. For a uh, Malaysian, if you are non-Muslim, you want to Malaya, you want to marry a Muslim, you must go, you must convert, no matter what. And also, uh, uh, beside that, you also, most of the youth doesn't realize the consequences and also the legal changes before and after they convert into Islam. So, uh, our conversion that takes place in Malaysia is actually very different from other countries. It's actually much more conservative. I, I do a copy uh, on this issue of conversion, especially uh, you have a copy of this. It is so crucial and important and urgent that our Catholic Bishop Conference of Malaysia come with the statement that what is the consequences if you convert into Islam? It's, um, conversion for me is actually a very simple thing. It's like, uh, let's say Paul. And <laughs> let's say Paul, uh, Paul is a Catholic. So when he converts, he becomes a uh, Father Kike, it's two different person. It's two different person. Why? When you convert, yeah, yeah. when you convert, you change your name. You not only change name. You we always describe conversion as one way to get. You can go in, you cannot go out. Mm -hmm. You you go into uh, you go into Islam. You get there until you pass away, and even after you pass away, uh. Your body belongs to an uh, Islam institution. Your property belongs to Islam institution. And when you convert, your children must convert together, no matter they're willing or not. That is happening in Malaysia. And um, even that you want to leave any property that to your uh, family member, you can't do that. That property is not yours. That is happening in Malaysia today. But most Catholics, they don't know these consequences. That's why conversion often happens. Especially among youth today, we, we can tell that every maybe every month there are thousands of youth are converting. They do not know these consequences and sadly when they go in they can't go out anymore. So this has been a, a rising issue in Malaysia. So how um how serious is this issue of evangelization and conversion happen in higher institutions, especially among our youth? This is the study they conducted by me. So, according to them, 64% of our respondent, which is Catholic students, admit that they are Muslim, approach them and evangelize about Islam. 84% that they knew someone around them, friend or relative, has converted to Islam. 62% of them come across an advertisement inviting non-Muslims to a gathering only for Muslims. And overall, 46 Almost half of them faced these three, three uh, situations before. So we can see from the figures, it's getting a very, very crucial situation here. So this is about conversion. We, um, in terms of minority rights, we would like to talk about also minority personalization. Freedom of religion basically is enshrined in the Malaysian constitution, it protects the right of the minority. What the constitution says is that we have right to profess and also practice our religion. And Islam is the official religion, but we can practice in peace and harmony. But that, uh, does this article come into place when it's practically no? Practically, minority rights are often infringed. What happened? In very very recently, 
our own competitors, we have filed a lawsuit against our government because of the, on the words of Allah, which means God in Malay. <coughs> they banned us from using God's word in our Malay Bible. They banned us because of what? Because Allah is their God. It's not a Catholic God, it's their God. When we are using our, our Allah for a few thousand years before Islam come into Malaysia, now they're saying that Allah is their God and we are not allowed to use. But uh, fortunately, we win the case in court last year. So Allah is still using in, in Malaysia today. And even only last year, 10 churches have been attacked by an unknown group. Because the government of Malaysia, they are mainly Muslim, and sometimes it's led to concern that this right of minority may, may often not be protected by this group of people. Not only Christians face the problem, but I think Hinduism, they face even more serious problems. We can look at the pictures that this happened when the temple in KL has been bulldozed by the government because they said the temple is illegal when the temple has been there for a few hundred years and it's, Ill it's illegal now under the government so uh, they are fighting against, uh, against it and according to a lawyer for Hindu Rights Action Task Force uh, a Hindu temple is demolished in Malaysia once every three weeks in three weeks each temple is demolished in Malaysia for Hinduism. They are facing the same fate as uh, our Christianity, but more, much more serious things like that. Am I going very fast? Sorry. So, um, I don't worry, I come to an end already. <laughs> my presentation is actually very short. Um, I would like to say that Malaysia is a country that uh, has different race, different diversity, different culture. Thus, interreligious dialogue come into a place that are very, very important. The implementation of on the dialogue need coordination from every party that involved. But um, unfortunately, I say that today Malaysian churches they do not encourage the implementation of interreligious dialogue. What happened is. Um, Basically, the word dialogue, it is not happening not only interreligiously, it is not happening in our church today, which are very much based in directive leadership rather than servant leadership. What I mean by directive, directive leadership here today is mean that when um, I'm working for, a, let's say I'm working for, for a, a a diocese and he's my parish priest. When he when I try to do something uh, for my activity, the parish priest will say, No, you don't have the right to do that. No, because I am a parish priest and I have right to say no to what you are doing. Because I know what am I doing so you stop that. That is directive leadership. <laughs> 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 That is directive leadership for me. They don't listen. Dialogue doesn't happen in place. Not only in the issue of uh, interreligious, but in the issue within Catholic themselves, they don't listen. So the, <laughs> this contradicting, I know, is this concept of dialogue for Malaysia. We always have been perceived as a kind of forum, as a kind of only for clergy rather than as experience for lady. For our lady, we, you, you rarely hear the word of interreligious dialogue. It's only for uh, uh, very high above people that they are talking about dialogues. As a result, what church are doing is they are passive against youth and engaged in social justice and interreligious dialogue, which are contradicting with the plural society that Malaysia live in today. So, um, I would like to actually ask this question that if, I just thinking that if dialogue doesn't happen with, even within our own church structure, even within 
the youth worker and parish priest, even within the parish priest and the bishop. What, how can we expect a dialogue happen outside the church? When you work, even in the dialogue within your same faith and same value that you can't talk, what more to say you go out and talk to other people with different faith and different kind of value which are so different. Um, here I would like to put an example of our dissolve of Malaysian Catholic Student Movement, MCSN case in Malaysia. So MCSN is basically a coalition on that really work on the work of human rights and justice. What happened uh, recently is MCSN being dissolved by a uh, Catholic Bishop Conference of Malaysia and they dissolved like uh, let's say this is the meeting of the Bishop Conference they just dissolved they say um, we, we don't want we do not need this MCSM anymore so we dissolved that happened in Malaysia that happened and MCSM has been established since 2003 it's been 8 years and None of the chaplain has been informed, student leader has been informed, no. So they just dissolve like that. So that is happening when dialogue doesn't happen within the church itself. So I would like to foresee here is intra-religious dialogue, in terms of inter-religious dialogue that we stress on. Intra-religious means that it's very simply means that the one who high above and the one below speaking the same message because we believe church is for all it's about all of us it's, um, we shouldn't have different because we are from the same church so um, what, what did I turn down here? Um, so if we still consider that church is for the future of our youth we should consider intra-religious to be happening in our church today let the youth also have a chance to speak on their own, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know how it looks when the top uh, talking a different message with the below. It's, it's a kind of what will people perceive as our Catholic Church is. Let's say uh, this is a church. Just now, it's, uh, there's a father said, uh, "This is this is the church." All, all of us are church. Let's say inter-religious dialogue happen between one, two, three, four, and four of them talking about a religion. One of them is our representative. But he doesn't represent every of us because we didn't voice to them our voice. So he doesn't know. So um, it's happening when he, what he thinks is opposed to what we think. So I think intra-religious make a very important point here before we can proceed to inter-religious dialogue where we facing people with other faiths. So, uh, I think, from, from, from my opinion, the season is the last, last slide, so don't worry, I'm very fast. <laughs> <laughs> the season only is, is not sufficient anymore today for our youth uh, to cater the need of our youth. The season is not sufficient. Our youth today, they need actions, they need experience, they need to experience reality that happened with our poor and with our marginalized. How did they experience that? They go down and they become one of them. And how will this youth benefit from the uh, from this is they will learn. They will learn the value of Christ-like value and norm. They will learn how to stop people. They will learn how to respect the poor and marginalized. And simultaneously, when people know at our youth doing this job, people will think, what will people think about Catholic Church is? Catholic Church is a Catholic Church for poor and marginalized. Slowly, we will bring people to Christ. Slowly, we will build a bonding about a dynamic nation that we really want to live in. I think that is my presentation today. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Future of the church, isn't it? <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. So um, I think we have a very good uh, presentation from 
the perspective from the young people, seeing how they are going to participate in the, in the church, especially in now and the future. Uh, both would like to really to have a voice in the community because this transition society really uh, affect the life of the young in futures a lot. And I think the voice is so important that uh, our we as a, 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 a higher, that we call it as a higher, the higher people could listen and think that this is somehow Asian theology forum. So coming from the young people, that would be a really uh, considerable in, in the message of the Asian changes. Thank you very much.